Well, good day. I think we had a real good class last time because I didn't have to talk all the time. So I hope we can have more of those kinds of classes because I sure hate to listen to myself talk. And uh, I enjoy talking to y'all. Notice how fast the class went last time with more participation? Uh, not only that, but the several of you were not asleep. So that was a good thing. Uh, can you hear us out in uh, Sugarland? Don't know whether they can or not. We started, we started last time, focusing on scientific creationism, <clears throat> and in addition to the readings that come from our book on uh, the meaning of creation by Hires, you need to be reading very carefully Henry Morris's book on scientific creationism, and then uh, later we're going to. <clears throat> Put that alongside Stephen Jay Gould's Rock of Ages, Science and Religion in the Fullness of Life. <clears throat> now, last time, one of the things that I emphasized was uh, one of my major concerns over the years in studying this subject, and that is the debate that goes on between the far extremes on this issue. The far extremes include the uh, what would be called the rightist uh, conservative Christian position, sometimes called fundamentalism, which has produced a, a, a conception of interpreting the Bible, which uh, in turn produced what is called scientific creationism. And uh, that is one end of the spectrum. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about how this conception uh, may have problems of its own in terms of the concerns that that conservative Christians have about what it's going to take to keep young people from becoming atheists and agnostics and naturalists. Perhaps uh, part of the problem lies with the other extreme, that is the complete atheistic, naturalistic view of Genesis and there, therefore of the nature of creation, the nature of science, uh, because sometimes scientific creationists are under the impression that that uh, all modern atheism and naturalism and uh, and agnosticism comes from these folks. That is, they're the ones who have made people into atheists. One of the points I want to make is that uh, conservative Christians need to understand enough about the history of Christianity and the history of the relationship between Christianity and culture, and specifically the history of the relationship between Christianity and science, to realize that often atheisms, atheists are made by Christians, and sometimes atheistic children are made by Christian parents. And uh, if that's one thing that Christians want to, want to avoid, then uh, perhaps my interest or my concern in helping us to understand both ends of the spectrum uh, might be helpful in doing that. <coughs> Henry Morris, who is the author of Scientific Creationism, and he's, he's the author of the book that is the general book entitled Scientific Creationism. He's also the author of the book that is the textbook, public school textbook. In other words, he has a public school textbook. It's not used by any public schools that I know of, uh, but there probably are some in which it's being used, uh, smaller places where the only science teacher may be a scientific creationist. Uh, and uh, I would be willing to uh, assume that that exists somewhere in the United States because this is a big place. But, uh, but the uh, public schools textbook has not made it into, into many public schools because it was premised on the idea that, that uh, scientific creationists were going to win a battle in the legislatures of several states and then they were going to win the battle in the court to make scientific creationism an equal study with the theory of evolution in public school classrooms. They lost that battle. They won the battle in the legislatures of Arkansas and Louisiana, but they lost the battle in the courts because both of those laws were declared to be unconstitutional. 
primarily on the basis of the conclusion of both judges that scientific creationism is not a scientific theory. Scientific creationism, according to the judges, now this may be right or wrong, judges are, judges are sometimes right and sometimes wrong, but I'm just stating what the judge determined. Uh, judge Overton in the Arkansas case determined that scientific creationism is not a science. It is not approved by the scientific community. Science, uh, scientific creationists do not publish any of their material about scientific creationism in uh, normal approved scientific journals. And so uh, it should not then be considered on the same level as uh, as the theory of creation, which is uh, defended by people and elaborated by people in uh, authoritative uh, normal scientific journals. And that as a matter of fact, scientific creationism arises out of a, of a previous uh, biblical stance. That is, a previous view that the biblical view of of uh, creation is a scientific account, a normal, a uh, natural historical account, a literal historical account of how the world came about. And therefore, it also is uh, problematic for the uh, First Amendment, separation of church and state, though that expression is sometimes pro is somewhat problematic itself since that expression does not occur, occur in the First Amendment. But somewhere in the First Amendment, there is a, uh, there is a presumption that uh, nobody should be able to present their religious perspective uh, in some kind of authoritative way uh, in the public schools, even though public schools did not exist at the time of the First Amendment. Uh, somehow or another, uh, for the sake of our children, we're supposed to make sure that no particular religious perspective is taught in the public schools to the exclusion, certainly, of other religious perspectives, and certainly uh, not to the exclusion of, uh, of uh, normal scientific theories. So, uh, the Overton judge, uh, Judge Overton, therefore, concluded that creationism was not science, but that, in fact, was a religious expression. And Henry Morris begins, the central thesis of scientific creationism uh, is essentially this. The biblical record, accepted in its natural and literal sense, gives the only scientific and satisfying account of the origin of things. Uh, it seems like he should have said, gives the only satisfying scientific account, because obviously there are other scientific accounts of the origin of things. But anyway, he says, giving the only scientific and satisfying account of the origin of things. The creation account is clear, definite, sequential, and matter-of-fact, giving every appearance of straightforward historical narrative. Now, Hires picks up especially hard on this word appearance, and uh, he uh, makes the statement, which is a pretty hard statement, the only word in the entire statement that can be affirmed with some confidence is the word appearance. Now, look at the statement again in the light of that statement. The creation account is clear, definite, sequential, and matter-of-fact, giving every appearance of straightforward historical narrative. Let me read what uh, Hires says uh, leading up to this final statement. Hires says, It is not at all self-evident that this material is a record or that it gives every appearance of straightforward historical narrative or that, it is natu it, that its natural sense is the literal sense or that by literal is meant scientific, sequential, or matter-of-fact. The only, that's when he says, the only word in the entire statement that can be affirmed with some confidence is the word appearance. Now, what is he saying? He's going to go now through a whole argument 
of how there is a reason why this statement has the appearance of historical sequential matter of fact. And that's because Henry Morris is, mis is, is using wrong interpretive tools to um, read Genesis. That it has the appearance only because we're carrying our own modernistic scientific prejudices into the reading of the text. So it may have the appearance of that, but as Harris says, we should, we should uh, note that, that it has the appearance of a scientific account, and then uh, try to find out whether this appearance is correct, or whether this appearance is just an appearance, and is somewhat deceptive. If we must then distinguish, uh, we if we must then distinguish between evolution and evolutionism, we must also distinguish between creation and creationism. Now, I don't know whether we've adequately distinguished between evolution and evolutionism, but we need to do that. Uh, and then, if we can do that, we also need to distinguish between creation and creationism. So, what is the distinction between evolution? and evolutionism. What would you say would be a major distinction? Now sometimes these words are used interchangeably as, as though they mean the same thing, but that's part of the confusion in this whole subject. What is the difference between evolution and evolutionism? Evolutionism is the study or belief of evolution. All right, it's the belief. It's uh, it's something beyond the theory of evolution, wouldn't you say? The theory of evolution is uh, is what? The theory of evolution is where you say that natural selection as a mechanism has operated through time. It's just the basic statement of scientific fact, whereas evolutionism is carrying it deeper in a sense of maybe making, using evolution to fulfill a metaphysical or a philosophical need. Okay. Um, evolution, of course, what you described is the Darwinian theory of evolution. There can be other theories of evolution, but basically evolution uh, deals with change over time. And uh, in Darwin's theory, this is affected by, uh, by his theory of natural selection. Uh, but evolution is an attempt at least to provide, a, uh, to provide a theory which can be worked with that assumes or takes in all of the facts in the natural world that we have to this point and tries to make sense out of it. Now, again, that doesn't uh, settle the question of what about the theory of evolution is true or what about the theory of evolution is false, but it does mean that at least here we're working on the basis of uh, an attempt to provide a scientific theory for something. Now, evolutionism, on the other hand, is uh, something beyond a scientific theory of evolution. There were scientific theories of evolution that weren't very scientific, but they were attempts at scientific theories of evolution before Darwin. We've already mentioned uh, that fact. But there was also a tremendous interest in a philosophical evolutionism before the time, time of Darwin. In other words, the stage was set philosophically in the culture, particularly of Great Britain and, and uh, Germany and other places. The stage was already set for a scientific theory of evolution because people were already beginning to believe in evolutionism. That is, that evolution is the key to understanding the whole of reality. And that uh, evolution, in fact, is a kind of a substitute for the traditional theistic view of God or the traditional Christian view of God. Those are not necessarily the same thing, but the traditional theistic and Christian views of God. That evolution provides, or at least they hoped that evolution would provide a philosophical and perhaps even a scientific explanation of the origin of things and the continuance of things that would not need uh, a specific biblical conception of God.
Now, there were people who believed that before Darwin was born. And so uh, uh, Darwin's theory uh, is, a, is in a sense related to evolutionism. And after Darwin's theory was produced, evolutionist certainly took it up and elaborated on it philosophically. Uh, one of the things that came out of this was what we today call social Darwinism. Now, social Darwinism is a part of evolutionism. It is not a part of Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin's, Darwin's theory of evolution uh, is, is, is a theory having to do with how things change over time. It's also a theory having to do with how did the species originate. Uh, Darwin's theory of evolution has nothing, in fact, to do with how the universe originated. Uh, that, uh, that is going to be uh, taken up by other people. But Darwin's theory of evolution is really very specific. And, uh, it's, uh, and Darwin's theory of evolution is limited to bio biology. Whereas evolutionists take the idea of evolution and apply it to everything in reality. That means that evolutionists will tend to be um, either people who believe that there is some kind of entelechy or spiritual force within nature or within matter itself that will eventually produce progress and change and uh, from their perspective result in an ultimately wonderful evolutionary outcome. That's also not Darwin. Darwin and Thomas Huxley despised those kind of evolutionists. From his perspective, uh, they were taking a purely scientific theory and making it into a uh, social theory and a philosophical theory. And, uh, uh, and that's exactly what lots of people did. That's what, uh, that's what uh, for instance, uh, German people did uh, between, the, uh, between the World Wars. In fact, it was already going on before World War I. That is the development of, of the extrapolation from the uh, scientific theory of evolution to a more general theory of evolution, which uh, sometimes can be labeled uh, social Darwinism, but uh, uh, evolutionists are not necessarily social Darwinists, but social Darwinism is a kind of evolutionism. And what does that mean? You're dealing here between a different, with a difference between science and scientific theory and philosophy and philosophical views of the world. Now, that distinction has to be made. Uh, there is one uh, prominent Christian apologetic writer of the 20th century, for instance, whose name is C.S. Lewis. And he was death on evolutionism. Some of the, some of the, uh, some of the sayings that are quoted by Henry Morris and some other scientific creationism, creationists come from C.S. Lewis because he writes on the myth of evolution. He writes on evolutionism. And from his perspective, evolutionism and the myth of evolutionism are diametrically opposed to the traditional Christian view of God and nature and history. But on the other hand, C.S. Lewis, and we'll look at this as we go along, C.S. Lewis was not a scientific creationist. He accepted Darwin's theory of evolution. And so in C.S. Lewis, you see a man who is fighting evolutionism, but he has no uh, inclination to fight a scientific uh, theory of evolution. And uh, even though he is kind of the darling of, uh, of fundamentalist and conservative evangelical Christians, uh, some of them have not noticed that difference uh, between his theology and their own. Well, do you get some idea then how, how we might distinguish between these two words? This is obviously arbitrary linguistically. In other words, we could call evolutionist anything, you know, <laughs> something else if we wanted to. But in order to make it uh, linguistically uh, clear, clearer that we're dealing with two different uh, kinds of thought, when we're dealing with uh, evolution, we're dealing with the scientific theory. And when we're dealing with evolutionism, we may be dealing, we're dealing with something more than a scientific theory. We're dealing with a philosophy of life or a philosophy of existence 
or philosophy of reality. And as a matter of fact, Charles Darwin uh, disagreed vehemently with the evolutionists of his day. Even though they liked him <laughs> because they thought that he had provided a scientific justification for their philosophy. He didn't like them because he didn't like the philosophy that, that they believed had come from Darwin. Uh, so this, this connection or this relationship between Darwin and evolutionists uh, during his own lifetime was a very tenuous relationship. But uh, uh, Darwin didn't accept their views, but they accepted Darwin's view as a scientific basis for their views. Now, in the same way, in order to kind of linguistically clear away some of the misunderstanding, uh, we should distinguish between creation and creationism. Now, I don't particularly like that because uh, uh, I don't particularly like having to use that kind of language because from my perspective, uh, a creationist is not necessarily a scientific creationist. But just in order to help clarify things, uh, I will go ahead and allow creationism to be used as shorthand for scientific creationism. And the reason why I uh, am willing to do that is because in the newspapers uh, and in the public battles that are going on, uh, media people don't make that distinction. When they talk about scientific creationists, what word do they usually use? Creation. In other words, there are people who believe in creation and there are people who believe in evolution. So what are they doing? They're using the word creation as, a, as a, an equivalent to creation, uh, to evolution. Well, that's what the scientific creationists are doing. But that's not what most Christian theologians are doing. Most Christian, most Christian theologians, in fact, uh, if, you, if you understand the, the definition of the word Christian or Jew, then uh, ordinarily, unless there's some kind of thing going on that I can't fathom, ordinarily these folks will believe in creation. Whether or not they believe in evolution, they will believe in creation. Because creation is... Uh, Inter, uh, inextricably related with monotheism. If you are a monotheist, if you believe there is a God who is outside of creation, then, then uh, if you believe that anything exists, you must believe in creation. That is, that this God has created that which we call nature. Or he's created everything else that is not himself. And so the most conservative fundamentalist Christian and the most liberal, tending toward humanist Christian, all believe in creation. And so the word creation should be reserved for a Christian doctrine, and it should not be confused with a modern, with a modernistic attempt on the part of some Christians to create a scientific theory. And so if you, if you define creation that way, Creation is the Christian doctrine that everything is absolutely dependent upon God. Creation is not the Christian doctrine that everything was created 6,000 years ago. That is not a Christian doctrine. Uh, it is not a Christian doctrine that evolution could not and did not occur. That's not a Christian doctrine. It may be true, but it's not a Christian doctrine. There are a lot of Christians who don't believe that. And so for the, for the doctrine that uh, uh, everything was created 6,000 years ago or recently or that human beings were created instantaneously and they, they could not have had a natural history of any kind. Uh, we need to just label that creationism. And uh, that way as we go through, hopefully I will continue to use the word creation in the sense of the Christian theological doctrine and creationism in the sense of this rather, rather new approach on the part of some Christians, a, very, a minority of Christians, 
as to how, interp how to interpret the book of Genesis. And uh, that might be helpful even for the media if they could learn that create scientific creationism is a modern invention. It's not the it's not the continuation of the traditional Christian view of Genesis. It is a modern invention in the light of modern uh, ideas. It's a reaction to Darwin. It did not precede Darwin. It's a reaction to Darwin. Yes. Could you define creationism again, please? Creationism, in the sense that we're going to be using it in this course, is a modern uh, version of how you interpret Genesis. In other words, you interpret Genesis just as, uh, just as uh, Henry Morris does, as the only scientific and satisfying account of the origin of things. The creation account is clear, definite, sequential, Matter of fact, giving every appearance of straightforward historical narrative. That's creationism. The interpretation of the Bible as a straightforward historical scientific narrative. Now, uh, in that sense, in the sense of believing in creation, Augustine was a creationist. But in the sense of believing in this, that Henry Morris has just described, Augustine was not a creationist. So it has nothing to do with the time you lived. It has to do with the way you interpret the Bible. So as I say, this is, this is kind of uh, hard for me because I don't like to restrict language in this way. But uh, restricting language in this way uh, may be helpful, especially I would, l I would love to see the next time there's a newspaper article on this controversy, I would love them to say that uh, this is a conflict between people who affirm the scientific theory of evolution and people who deny the scientific evolution, deny the scientific doctrine of evolution and uh, call themselves creationists. I don't, I don't like to see this is a conflict between those who believe in creation and those who believe in evolution, because that's not the conflict. Uh, a large portion of those who believe in some theory of evolution, and there are different theories. <laughs> you know, uh, Stephen Jay Gould uh, may agree with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, most neo Darwinists, uh, he doesn't agree with old type Darwinists, uh, but he also disagrees with some other neo Darwinists on some ways in which the theory of evolution works. So there's no disagreement among most of these evolutionists that evolution has occurred. Um, but. Uh, uh, but a, a great many neo-Darwinists also believe in creation. Darwin himself believed in creation. If you read his Origin of Species and other of his writings, he will make a distinction between creation. He will talk about creation in a very positive way. But then he will talk about something in a, in a negative way, and that is special creation. So what we are calling creationism, Darwin called in his work special creation. By the time he had finished his work on the origin of the species, he had not come to deny creation. That was his major in college, was the doctrine of creation and the, and the argument from design by William Paley. That's what he majored in in college. He didn't major in science. So he still believed in creation, but he did not believe in special creation, which means what? That is, that the Genesis 1 uh, is right when interpreted as a narrative is a historical narrative about the origins of the species and the origins of the earth. Now, 
Darwin did not understand that there were other ways of interpreting Genesis. He seems not to have. Thomas Huxley did. Thomas Huxley understood that there were other ways of interpreting Genesis, and he commends the people who interpret Genesis in another way. But Thomas Huxley's anger with religious people is that so many of the religious people continued to interpret Genesis in this literal way, and therefore were developing an anti-scientific argument against Darwin's theory. And what Huxley wanted is for Darwin's theory to be accepted with open minds by Christians uh, because those, most, of the Christ, most of the scientists in Britain at the time were Christians. And so if, if Christians did not accept it with open minds, there weren't many scientists who would accept it. And so he wanted Christians to accept it with an open mind even though he was not a Christian himself. So he understood, he understood that, we're, that there were some Christian evolutionists before Darwin. Uh, he understood, for instance, that Wallace, who produced, the, uh, who produced the same theory of evolution, basically, except he was a little late, was a Christian theist. So he understood that you could accept the theory of evolution and be a uh, Christian theist. But he was angry at the fact that a great many people were already beginning to say you could not be a Christian theist and accept the theory of evolution. That's where Huxley's fight was. And uh, for some reason, we have a view of this period which is totally askew. We kind of assume that all of the good scientists had the same theology as Thomas Huxley. But they didn't. Thomas Huxley had a very, was a very small minority theologically. Uh, so in order, to, in order to get Darwin's theory accepted, he knew that he had to convince people who were not going to change their theology. They were not going to become agnostics, but he had to change their minds in, re in reference to being open to science. And that's what happened in England. Otherwise, the theory of evolution would not have uh, become a standard theory. That's what happened in the United States. Uh, there, were, there, was, there, were, there was one uh, orthodox Calvinist Christian theologian in the United States, who was a professor at Harvard and at Oberlin, uh, named Asa Gray. And uh, he was Darwin's staunchest defender in the United States during Darwin's lifetime. Now, he carried on a conversation with Darwin, trying to convince Darwin that Darwin could hold his theory of evolution and still be an Orthodox Christian. But he never convinced Darwin of that. And Darwin. Uh, uh, never, uh, never attacked uh, this man's uh, orthodoxy because uh, this man was his, his greatest public defender. Darwin's, uh, Darwin's most uh, formidable opponent at Harvard University during that same period was a man named Louis Agassiz. And Louis Agassiz was not an orthodox Christian. He was a rather Unitarian he was a rather uh, uh, almost agnostic Unitarian. He still believed uh, in creation, but he uh, certainly didn't believe in what most modern scientific creationists mean by creation. But he also didn't accept Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, by the way, now holds the chair of Alexander Agassiz at Harvard University. and. Uh, uh, I guess I need to look into how Alexander fit in, fits into all this, but the fact that, a, that Stephen Jay Gould is teaching biology at Harvard University, Louis would just roll over in his grave because, because he was the foremost opponent of Darwinism. So at Harvard, we had the interesting uh, juxtaposition of an orthodox Calvinist theologian who was Darwin's foremost opponent. I mean proponent, and a Unitarian, a rather liberal Unitarian, who was his foremost opponent. And we'll talk about that later on because James Moore, who your name, you may have run across his name already in your reading, has written a wonder, wonderful book on the relationship between theology and, and the acceptance of the Darwinian theories 
in the 19th century. And you would be surprised that Darwinian evolution had better acceptance among conservative Calvinist theologians than it did among liberal evolutionists. Liberal evolutionists didn't like Darwin's pessimism. The Calvinists loved it. <laughs> in other words, the Calvinists already knew that human beings were, were horrible uh, creatures. And so it didn't bother them to find out that uh, human beings have not always been angels. In fact, theologically, they knew that this statement that sometimes people say uh, that evolution and creation is the difference between uh, man being a, a fallen angel, uh, there is nothing in the Bible about man being a fallen angel. The Calvinists knew that. And so uh, the Calvinists knew that uh, it was going to be hard to find in human history this bright Christian uh, concept of, of, of uh, or this liberal Christian concept of human nature. That actually in history, if you understand um, Darwin's theory of evolution, you'll have a very pessimistic view of human nature. And that was one of the differences between Darwin and the evolutionists. The evolutionists had a to totally optimistic view of human nature. That every day, day by day, in every way, things are get, getting better and better. Darwin didn't have that view. In fact, the guy who said that, every day, in every way, things are getting better and better, committed suicide. So he, his optimism kind of, uh, kind of petered out. But do you understand what I'm saying? Is that what, what we have here, when we, when we define these things, uh, we find that there's a very complex relationship going on in American and British thought uh, that is produced by the bombshell of Darwin's theory of evolution. And it is not a clear-cut thing where Darwin produced his theory and all of the agnostics and naturalists lined up on his side and then all of the Christians and creation people lined up on the other side. That's just not the way it happened. If that's the way it had happened, then we would not probably never have heard of the Darwin's theory of evolution because it had to be accepted by Christian scientists in order to uh, uh, ever win. But what Darwin is saying is that special creation, the view that human beings were created specially and were not part of a much broader development, uh, he could not see how that could be maintained after his theory. But he never writes anything that says, I don't believe in creation, because that's a different subject. Okay, does anybody have a, have a, um, he later became uh, uh, much more pessimistic. And his life uh, was, uh, became kind of a miserable one. So by the end of his life, he did not have near as much confidence in the reality of the biblical concept of God as he had when he was a young man. But he never declared himself to be an atheist or to, or to know that creation did not take place. He thought he knew that special creation did not take place. Somebody was trying to raise their hand a while ago, and I ignored them. Who was it? <laughs> Better not ever do that again. Anybody have any reaction or comment? So we must distinguish between creation and creationism and between evolution and evolutionism. Creationism is a particular theory about the literal interpretation of scripture, which leads to particular theories about science and nature, and in turn to a variety of tactics aimed at bringing scientific data and its interpretation into conformity with this literal interpretation of scripture. Which leads me again to make the point that I made last time. These people are not anti-scientific per se. They want 
to be scientific. They also want to hold on to a literal view of Genesis. And so they will tell you, as one of their basic perspectives, science and, and the Bible cannot be in conflict. It cannot be in contradiction. Now, if science and the Bible cannot be in contradiction, there are only two ways to avoid that contradiction. One is the scientific creationist way, and that is interpreting the Bible, uh, interpreting science in the light of a literal understanding of the Bible, and just declaring scientific theories which are not in conformity with the literal interpretation of the Bible to be unscientific. They don't say, stay away from that nasty science. What they say is, stay away from those nasty scientists who, who are trying to put forth theories which are only theories and cannot be true because the Bible says different. You understand the difference between that? Uh, here are some questions for evolutionists that kind of give you the mindset of a creationist. Uh, this comes from the Center of Science for Scientific Creationism. Uh, and here again, they're making, the, they're making this mistake, which is problematic. They're saying scientific creation, biblical creation. Um, uh, Henry Morris uses the term creationism more, and so that's, that's more helpful. Questions for evolutionists. Where was macroevolution ever been observed? Where has macroevolution ever been observed? Well, that brings another term into our conflict. What in the world is macroevolution? Well, one thing that uh, this brings is, is another point that I'm making, that these people are not totally anti-scientific. Because if he's opposed to macroevolution, there may be some kind of evolution he's in favor of. What is it? What is the opposite of macro? Micro. Micro. So what this man is saying, even though we're not going to get to his elaboration of it, uh, what this man is saying is that there might be some truth to, ma to microevolution. But what is microevolution from his perspective? Okay, from his perspective, now used to, scientific creationism argued that the species were originally created by God and that the species have never changed. Okay, most scientific creationists know better than that now. They know that species have changed. And they, and they know, uh, in fact, that maybe even new species have uh, come into existence. But they, what they do is, is they take the biblical word kind as a literal description of something. You know, there's always the uh, tree of life in which you categorize, categorize life. And species is, uh, is, is one, of the, uh, one of the highest uh, or one of the latest categories. Uh, you have other categories category like phyla and so forth. Well, from their perspective, from these people's perspective, maybe the word kind goes back beyond species. Maybe species are not the first thing that have created that were created. Maybe something, maybe kind means something farther up the evolutionary ladder. So from their perspective, it's possible for there to have been some change over time. There's possible for, for them that there was, was some evolutionary change, though they hate to use that word because when they use that word, uh, they may be giving people the wrong idea that they believe in the theory of evolution. But there may have been some change over time. There may have been some in, in evolutionary change. Uh, they certainly see it in operation in what is called artificial selection. In other words, a scientific creationist uh, does not deny that there's a that that, for instance, uh, uh, dachshunds have been produced in recent history. That uh, what we know as dachshunds didn't exist in exactly that same form before, that there's been some natural selection, that people have actually uh, selected uh, traits out and selected traits in. 
And so you, you now have uh, Mausers, you have uh, Dachshunds, you have uh, Dobermans, you have all these different kinds of animals. And you have some animals that should never have been produced because, <laughs> because they, are, they, are, they are so high strung that they're crazy all their lives or they are so physically uh, inept that, uh, that they uh, are prone to disease and, uh, and injury and so forth. You know, there are a lot of dogs that have been produced by artificial selection that are really not all that healthy animals. <laughs> They've been made where they can't walk without their belly dragging the ground or all kinds of different things. But scientific creations know, creationists know about this. They know that there's such thing as artificial selection. And so they know that there may be some changes uh, even above the species level. But they believe that at some point you have to say, well, wait a minute, this is the earliest thing we have. And it doesn't go back to, uh, it doesn't go back to a one-celled animal. Creation occurred at some point in the past in which all animal kinds were created. In other words, they will accept some form of microevolution but they will not accept macroevolution. And macroevolution is the view that even what a scientific creationist would call a kind is the result of a long development. That is, that all life, uh, uh, at least all human life, presumably, came from one individual, and perhaps all life came from one individual. But uh, at, at the most, all life came from a few individuals uh, who, were, who, uh, who developed uh, complexity uh, over millions and millions of years until finally human beings were produced. Now, a, a most creation scientists, scientific creationists, uh, even if they accept microevolution, cannot accept any form of evolution in terms of human beings. Because human beings, from their perspective, are unique in all creation. And human beings, therefore, had to be created instantaneously by God, not too long in the past, in order that they would be fit to uh, be receptacles of an immortal soul, of the human soul. Now, what I'm going to say later on in the course will, uh, will call in question that need because uh, that view is not based certainly on Protestant theology because uh, uh, that, that is more akin to Catholic theology. But it is not, uh, it's, it's not a view that is really based on Protestant theology and since all of these scientific creationists are are usually Protestants, uh, there might be some question as to their feeling of the need that human beings be created uh, directly by special creation. So macroevolution is what Darwinianism is. So <laughs> he's not going to he's not going to challenge the possibility of micro changes. But he, he does want to know, where has macroevolution ever been observed? Where has it ever been observed that a uh, mouse-like animal uh, evolved eventually into an ape-like animal and then an ape-like animal evolved eventually into a human? Where has that ever been observed? And of course, it's never been observed. And uh, that is not occurring in a way in the world today that you can observe it. And uh, so that is a pretty good question for an evolutionist. I assume that an evolutionist can answer it, but it's still a pretty good question. What's the mechanism for getting new complexity, such as new vital organs? That's a question. And uh, evolutionists should not uh, skirt around that question. Surely they can answer it, is what he's assuming. How, for example, should a caterpillar evolve into a butterfly? No, he's not assuming they can answer it, but he's assuming that they should be able to answer it if they're going to defend their theory. 
Where are the billions of transitional fossils that should be there if your theory is right? Now, Stephen Jay Gould will tell you that, there, that these billions of transitional fossils do not exist. He will say that is still no argument against the theory of evolution, but he agrees that they do not, they do not exist. So he, he's under obligation, from my perspective, to explain to uh, scientific creationists why he doesn't uh, think that's a problem. Why don't we see a reasonably smooth continuum among all living creatures or in the fossil record or both? Well, Stephen Jay Gould himself asked that question and determined that Darwinism did not answer it. So he came up with what? He came up with a punctuated theory of evolution. That is, that things stay the way they are for millions of years. There's no continuum. But things may stay the way they are for millions of years, and then all of a sudden, for some reason, there is a punctuated uh, uh, jump in evolution. So in a sense, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, even, though he, even though he did not come up with this theory to answer scientific creationists, uh, has come up with a theory which scientific creationists were asking for before he came up with it. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, because they, they, scientific creationists, may not know much about the mechanism of evolution, but they do know that there are not enough fossils to uh, justify Darwin's uh, way of understanding evolution. What evidence is there that information such as that in DNA could ever assemble itself? Well, that is the crux of the matter, and that's, that's the crux of the matter particularly with the newer, younger creationists who don't call themselves creationists, but who call themselves design advocates, because uh, they also agree that DNA could never assemble itself, that DMA, DNA is much too complex to do that. And so an evolutionist has to come up with some mechanism from their perspective to show how the DNA could assemble itself. Uh, otherwise, they should be open to some concept of design in nature. Uh, and so when we get to talking about the, uh, the new uh, younger scientists who are arguing for, uh, who are arguing for design, uh, that will come up with them too. The difference is the new younger scientists who are arguing for design are much better scientists than any of these guys, any of these guys that are in, uh, involved in the old scientific creationist movement. And so uh, that's the reason why the younger guys are making naturalists even more angry <laughs> than the old scientific creationists do. And they're writing all kinds of books on the subject now that weren't being written just a few years ago. If astronomers receive, this is also has to do with the argument from design, if astronomers received an intelligent radio signal from some distant galaxy, most people would conclude that it came from an intelligent source. Why then doesn't the vast information sequence in the DNA molecule of just a bacteria also imply an intelligent source? Now, of course, uh, scientific creationists of the 30s weren't asking these questions. Why? Because they didn't know what a DNA was. But now they know what a DNA is, and so they're asking these questions. How could organs as complicated as the eye or the ear or the brain of even a teeny bird ever come about by chance or natural processes? The, uh, the design argument has always been uh, based on the concept of irreducible complexity. Is that I, B, or A, B? I think it's I. Ir, two R's. Irreducible complexity. In other words, if you look at the world, the, the one that used to be used, uh, even by Paley and other 
in the 19th century was the eyeball. The eyeball is such a complex organism that no, no mechanism that Darwin suggested could possibly satisfy, uh, from the perspective of these arguers, could possibly satisfy an intelligent person on how an eyeball came to exist that is so complex in its movements that uh, if it if it did happen by chance, then there's not enough time in the history of the universe for it to happen. But anyway, that's the that's the argument from irreducible complexity, and this is also the argument that the new uh, that the new uh, design people are talking about. Particularly, you remember the book that I recommended by Michael Behe called Darwin's Black Box. He particularly uses the second question here. How could a bacterial motor evolve? Uh, I'm going to bring a picture of a bacterial motor. Uh, obviously, it's an imaginative picture <laughs> because you can't see a bacterial motor as good as this picture. So this is going to be a this is going to be a model of a bacteria bacteria's motor bacteria motor, and uh, and you're going to see how incredibly complex that is. And that's just one example, Behe says, of the irreducible complexity in nature that cannot be explained by, by any Darwinian uh, modality. And uh, so that's still a question. That's not just a question of the scientific creationists. That's still a, that's a question that's now being raised by, uh, by other folks. If it takes intelligence to make an arrowhead, why doesn't it take vastly more intelligence to create a human? Do you really believe that hydrogen will turn into people if you wait long enough? That's, that's a nice... Uh, what? <laughs> that's a nice uh, creationist argument. But you know, uh, that's an argument that, uh, that scientists are going to have to patiently answer if they're going to commend uh, any theory of evolution to ordinary folks out there in the, in the, in the hinterland. Uh, Dwayne Gish, for instance, would ask this question. In fact, they, it sounds like they got this question from Dwayne Gish. One time Dwayne Gish was debating uh, a California evolutionist uh, whose name escapes me now, but I'll bring a quote from this debate in one of these days. And uh, the California uh, evolutionist was making the point that uh, apes, or at least uh, certain monkeys and human beings, have, uh, what is it, 90 some percent, uh, or 90, 90 some percent the same. And Dwayne Gish answer was, well, uh, human beings are 90 percent water. Watermelons are 90 percent water. Therefore, watermelons and human beings are about the same. Well, that's the kind of argument that sometimes goes on here. But that's not the kind of argument that will go on in the next few years when these younger creationists or design people start arguing. And even some of these old scientific creationists have caught some naturalistic evolutionists off guard in debate because some before before uh, Jay Gould and these other people really understood much about scientific creationists. They would sometimes agree to a debate with somebody, not realizing that this somebody was not a total ignoramus, that he could speak English and that he could speak English well and that he could debate well. And so one evolutionist, one evolutionist um, our defender of the theory of evolution, went into a debate and he just got waxed. And now the reason why we know he got waxed is because he said so. He said, I've never been more humiliated in my life and I'm glad my mother wasn't here to see it. Well, in other words, he may have had, he may have had the correct theory, but he wasn't prepared to answer these questions, which people have. Which came first, DNA, DNA or the proteins needed by DNA? What does that sound like? The chicken and the egg. And the chicken and the egg, of course, is still a philosophical question that nobody can answer. Uh, 
and uh, uh, supposedly if an evolutionist is going to argue that DNA is the result of an evolutionary process, especially all of the information that goes into DNA, then uh, uh, the scientific creationist wants them to give them a mechanism that, that they can understand. That may not be possible, but that's what they want. Yes. Seems like some of these questions are, are fairly legitimate. Yeah. Uh, especially some of the early ones, but then some of the latter ones seem to be almost kind of a, a yin, 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 or it's a real a childish emotional they're debating reaction. Points. And it's, it's almost as if it, it dilutes to where you, you almost you can't take it seriously, but some of the questions are quite legitimate. So, yeah. you know, if you come in as a, as a, as a somewhat neutral observer, if that's possible, you look at both both positions, and it's almost like it's like the presidential debates. You know, will that's you two right. guys quit sticking your tongue at each other and let's talk about issues? That's right. That that's right. It's it's a uh, na 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 na, but it's it's basically a debating point, just like the watermelon. I you know, oh Gish, Gish probably himself is smart enough to know that that wasn't a legitimate uh, uh, comparison or analogy. But anyway, if you're in debating, his audience, by the way, I've seen this on film, his audience was made up primarily of Amish and Mennonite people. And, uh, and so that would be a good argument in that context. But the, uh, the thing about it is, in this particular debate, the evolutionary man got up and he started out by saying, this, we shouldn't even be discussing this anymore because this discussion was held in the latter part of the 19th century and you guys lost. Well, that's a good debating point. <laughs> you guys lost. Uh, so anyway, they, they sometimes have fun in these debates, but, but not much light comes out of them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, push the button. Um, my question, you know, like he said, that some of the early questions seem to be legitimate, mm -hmm. but it seems like, in a way, first of all, they have two problems. Like, first of all, it seems like while the questions are legitimate, it seems they're questions asked by scientists as well as creationists. Yes. So, I mean, it's not really support of being That's a creationist. Good. And the second thing is, is if it is, oh, you have to be a creationist because of this, then it seems like they're setting themselves up for the same God of the gaps thing that we saw earlier that... You know, okay, so if you have to have it now, maybe later our scientific knowledge will increase, and then we won't need your dorky theory anymore. Yeah, the God of the gaps is a problem for scientific creationists. And, um, and uh, evolutionists are trying to pin that also on the new uh, design people, that they're going back to the God of the gaps. Uh, they're primarily asking them what use is an argument for design scientifically. In other words, what, what uh, results will come if you convert us to a an argument for design, what results will come uh, scientifically? And that's a good question for the design people. And that pushes us back to the primary question as to what is the reason for scientific creationism? What is the reason for the argument from design? It is a theological reason, not a scientific one. You had something. I was just going to say that the it seems that in some respects that the uh, theory of evolution in some ways is as much of only a theory as the creation theory is. There's a lot of unanswered questions still. Well, on one level it is, but uh, we, if you read Jay Gould, you'll get, you'll get an answer to that question in the following way. There is a theory of evolution. For instance, Darwinism is a theory of evolution. But there is also, he says, the fact of evolution, which the theory of evolution is trying to understand. Now, do you see the difference between those two ideas? Um, Gould would argue that it's not legitimate to just to argue that evolution is just a theory. Well, in a, uh, in a sense, evolution is just a theory. But there's no such thing as just a theory. You know, we talked about uh, uh, 
Paul Tillich was worrying because people were saying just a symbol. No such thing as just a symbol. There's no such thing as just a theory. A theory is essential to scientific uh, progress. And so what Jay Gould would say is, it's true that we're going to be flopping around here maybe the rest of our lives trying to figure out what theory of evolution best explains the facts of evolution. But he says, he says the fact of evolution is there. So that's one of the things that Jay Gould and others need to explain properly to people, if they believe it, to explain prop properly to people. That way, uh, and I think, I think some of them know it. For instance, the distinction between microevolution and macroevolution is, uh, in a sense, the difference between the fact of evolution versus the theory of evolution. Because if you, believe, if you believe that some evolution has taken place, then you already believe in the fact of evolution. But you may not believe that, uh, you may not believe any particular person's theory of it. But as has already been pointed out, these discussions are going on among scientists. And scientific creationists know that. They read these books. So they will pick out some sentence from Jay Gould in which Jay Gould criticizes Darwin and see, and say, see, Darwin doesn't have anything, you know, doesn't have anything to it. And that makes Jay Gould angry because he thinks Darwin does have something to it, but he thinks that Darwinism has to be adjusted as we go along and understand different things. Darwin had no concept of DNA. Darwin had no concept of, uh, of a number of things that scientists now deal with. And so what the theory of evolution has to do is to take into its account our knowledge of DNA. And uh, if it cannot absorb our knowledge of DNA, then maybe the theory of evolution will have a flat and you know run off the road. But if it can absorb it in some way, then uh, uh, maybe the theory of evolution is still the most viable way to deal with things. But even the new design people who accept more than microevolution, the new design people uh, make Jay Gould very happy because if they, were, if they were voting on a school board, they would vote for the theory of evolution to be taught in public schools. But they don't think that any theory of evolution can adequately encompass things like DNA. And so there must be some meta explanation. There must be some explanation above what scientists can deal with. So that's the battle that's now going on. And uh, naturalistic scientists think it's just, it's just creation science wrapped up in a different robe. And in a sense, that may be true in that, that both creation scientists and the new design people have the same concerns. But it's also not true in a very signif significant sense, and that is that the new design people are very good scientists. Uh, two of the chairs of, in science at Rice University are held by design people. So you can't just go around and say, well, these are just a bunch of engineers that, that think they're scientists, but they're not. So it, it's, it's becoming a more complex uh, question. Scientific investigation is made subservient to a theory of biblical exegesis in the old scientific creationism. A theory, furthermore, which is repudiated by the vast majority of biblical scholars and theologians. Now again, let me re make reference to the new design people that we're going to be studying later. Their investigation is not made subservient to a theory of biblical exegesis, like the old scientific creationists. It is made subservient to a belief in creation. You understand the difference? In other words, design people believe in creation. So they believe that you can investigate nature uh, under the impact of that presupposition. But they do not interpret Genesis 1 the way the old scientific creationists do. And so that's a distinction we're going to have to learn. Because the uh, biblical exegesis that Henry Morris uses is repudiated by the vast majority of biblical scholars and theologians. That doesn't mean it's wrong. You know, it's not my job to tell you which of these 
is right and wrong. But it does mean that uh, in, the, uh, in the big picture of things, most present-day biblical theologians do not interpret Genesis 1 the way Henry Morris does. And they believe that you can be a Christian and go to heaven even if you don't interpret the Bible that way. The brand of science which results from Henry Morris is likewise rejected by the vast majority of scientists, even scientists who are Christians. Yet in discussions of conflict between science and religion, the possibility of a faulty theory of biblical interpretation is ne never seriously considered by Morris. Uh, I think Hires is sometimes a little bit too heavy on some of these people because they do consider that. They just reject it. And they reject it for theological reasons, not for scientific reasons. Uh, Henry Morris and other folks cannot, just cannot get the Christian doctrine of sin and atonement and the doctrine of the incarnation. They just cannot get how that can possibly be true if Darwin's theory of evolution is true for instance. Now, uh, I think that's a matter, that's a matter of a, a little bit more study and at least they could understand how those two things go together even if they don't ultimately um, accept them. But, uh, but these issues are theologically motivated. In other words, if Henry Morris did not believe that the world was created and did not believe that Jesus Christ was the incarnation of God, he, wouldn't, he would be doing something else for a living. So they're definitely theologically motivated. Uh, and uh, as I think even Judge Overton said, the, the, the scientific creationism may be true, but it is not scientific. In the same way, for instance, that I can, I can come up here day after tomorrow and I can present you with a theory that we all came into existence yesterday. Now, that would not be in conformity with your experience. But you still couldn't disprove it. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, because I could argue that it just appears to us that we were in existence day before yesterday. And, and what these scientists are saying is that's the kind of thing the scientific uh, doctrine of creationism is. It just, appears, uh, it just appears to us that we are very old, that human beings are very old, that the earth is very old. Because when God created the earth, it would obviously appear to be very old. I don't know why it would obviously appear to be very old, but that's the argument. And so you see, uh, that's the reason why uh, scientists say this, can, this is not a scientific discussion. Uh, you may be right. God may have created everything to look old, but I am a scientist, so I simply have to assume that what it looks like is what it is. Yes. Uh, We're about ready to quit here. A question. Yeah, push the button. <laughs> okay, I'll push the button. Um, my question is, though, if they think that, okay, God could make the world to where it looks, just appears like it's old, then doesn't that mean that God could lie? And if God lies, then why would we want to trust him? Okay, that, that would be a distinction that uh, some theologians would make, and that would be a distinction that Jay Gould would make. He, he would say that such a view of God means that God is deceiving us. But some people would accept that in a, in a certain way, just like the old man that uh, taught me that, that the dinosaur bones were put in, put in by God to, to uh, test us. In a sense, that's a kind of a deception. But they still believe that an old earth and old human beings cannot be made to be, a, cannot be adjusted to Orthodox Christian doctrines, and that's the, that, that's the key to their problem. But that's a discussion among Christians. Uh, that's, not, that's not really a discussion between Christians and non-Christians.
Okay, did anybody want the last word? I think I would have to trust something that could make me this old in 10 seconds. Yeah. Well, I trust, I trust scientists. I trust science. And I don't believe that uh, you have to distrust scientists, science in order to believe the Bible. That's the discussion we're having. Okay. Uh, next time, have read that book.